Okay, before I start, you guys may be wondering why are we talking so much about politics lately? Well, this is because you can ignore politics, but politics will never ignore you. Whether you like it or not, politics will affect your quality of life, whether it's education, access to opportunities, salary, and ultimately your wealth. Since we are nearing G15, you are probably seeing a lot of political news as well. So today we are speaking to Tony Pua, a political veteran from DAP, and he will share with us his thoughts on the current political scene in Malaysia and who is likely to win G15 and become your new government. This year's GE15, many people can see that all the political parties are everywhere. Now, and many analysts are also wondering, like, is there any possibility that any party can even win a clear majority, right? So this time around, the G15 is a little bit odd. What are your thoughts on this? It's odd. It is perhaps a little unsettling for most Malaysians. It poses huge question marks for everyone. So it creates uncertainty. And in, in any event of uncertainty, people are a little bit scared. If you are not scared, perhaps they are, they are confused. And because they are somewhat confused and they see it's a mess, they get a little bit distant, a little bit apathetic. Uh, but I actually see it as a transitional process for Malaysia and Malaysians. You know, we, we have been used to a one-party democracy for the longest time, yep. forever. And it only changed in 2018. Of course, the change wasn't clean, so to speak. Uh, we changed and then there was upheavals and then there have been changes of prime ministers along the way. But all these should be seen as part of the transition process to a maturing democracy. Where there are competing parties, everyone has a realistic chance of winning. And even in winning, may not get absolute majority. So you will have to work with different parties to form new coalition governments. For example, uh, Pakatan Harapan might end up with 80 seats. That's not enough for 112. That's 32 short. Uh, but perhaps BN will end up with 70 seats. Those are the two largest blocks. And then we have to talk to all other parties, particularly in Sabah and Sarawak, to work out who are the parties that can best able to work together to form a government. That's, to me, uh, part of a maturing democratic process. It's not new in this world is actually very common in many European countries. Mm -hmm. And they are very stable. Mm. You know, Germany, for example, have switching collisions almost every election. They form government, after the government gets dissolved or the parliament gets dissolved, they'll fight each other again. And whatever the outcome, they'll start talking to one another again in order to form a new uh, collision government. And, and, and that's part of the process that Malaysians will have to learn, the country will have to go through before we come up with what is deemed uncertain today as something common and stable going forward. Right. So in, a, in, in, in what you are saying there, uh, generally, although we are not used to this kind of situation over the many, many years, uh, but actually it's quite a common thing in the world, right? And uh, to a certain extent, as well, it's pretty good because it creates this tension of check and balance all the time instead Absolutely. of a domineering party that is like, oh, show win so I can do whatever I want, That's right? right. Yeah. So uh, in view of that, you also mentioned about like Sabah Sarawak there. So recently, uh, Shafi made a statement and he said that Sabah and Sarawak will be the kingmakers. Maybe you can share with the people because I think a lot of people are new to politics with that new block of voters and so on. They may not really understand what does that really mean actually. That just means in very simple terms, uh, if, to make it simple for purposes of illustration, if I have 100 votes, 100 seats, mm -hmm. and uh, BN has 100 seats, and someone in Sabah and Sarawak has got 22 seats, mm -hmm. right? Then whoever that 22 seats work with becomes the government. Right. So those, that's, that's the kingmaker role. That 22 seats have an outsized voice in determining which 100 MPs will become part of government and which 100 MPs is out of government. So being a kingmaker has its political advantages, perhaps unfairly, but it's the reality. They will talk to either party, what do you offer me? All right. Uh, which ministerial positions will I get 
for my 22 MPs. Hmm. You know, so, so they will get an outsized say in determining who becomes the government. Uh, but in our case, perhaps it's a little bit different uh, in the sense that while we do have two sizable blocks, we believe that Pakatan Harapan has probably the biggest block. Barisan National, also in Peninsular Malaysia, has another big block. Uh, we would like to believe that they will get less than us. But they are more than one kingmaker. Mm. It's not just Sabah. Warisan stands in Sabah and right. Sabah only. They have a few seats in Peninsular Malaysia, but we don't expect them to make inroads here. Okay. Uh, but they will be strong in Sabah. There's also GPS in Sarawak mm. with another block of 20 more or less. Mm -hmm. See, then don't forget there's still PAS and Persatu that have the Perikatan National Coalition. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple kingmakers. And so the the whole, what do you call it, the, the, the whole permutations of who can be real kingmaker uh, or pretend kingmaker <laughs> is still up for uh, debate depending on what actually happens after elections. So if you, as a kingmaker, you have got maybe 15 seats and everyone got 20 seats, uh, you say you want to be kingmaker, he says you want to be kingmaker, then let me see who offers less, then I'll work with who. Mm. So, so it's not just, if I'm the single kingmaker, that makes it easy. I can command anything I want. Right. Right. But if there are multiple kingmakers, then it's a question of, let me talk to you. Oh, your demands are ridiculous. Let me talk to him. His demands are reasonable. They are willing to go along with our policies and meet our manifesto goals. Uh, we will work with them and not work with you. Right. So, so, so that, the, the, the complication arises. The permutations are a little bit complicated. Also dependent on the final outcome of the elections. Mm. So having said that, so this time round is not just one kingmaker, as you have said, but there are multiple kingmaker in here, right? And you're looking at it, like you say, PN, uh, Warisan, GPS, and so on. Uh, from what we have known so far, right? Um, we know that previously, Warisan has a very close relationship with PH. And that is something that a lot of people has been asking the public, say, hey, could you work together again, right? Uh, but there are also certain analysts saying that that's, that's not being possible anymore. So if let's say post-election, we don't see a sim simple like majority there, right? Pakatan Harapan, who are the people that you think will most likely end up forming a coalition or you'll be pursuing that? We would pursue a coalition in the event that we have the biggest block but are unable, is unable to form the government. We will be talking to all parties and seeing if any of the other parties are willing to align themselves with the goals that we want to achieve for Malaysia. Right. If there is common goals, 90%, 95% the same, compromise of 5%, we'll be very happy with that. Right. That's, that's an example. Right. Uh, so at this point in time, because we are contesting against one another, uh, to put it very cynically of politicians, uh, <laughs> they'll say whatever they want to win the votes now. But after voting is done, politicians from both sides of the divide have no choice but to sit down to trash out deals. Right. Now, there's no need for me to trash out a deal with you now. So an example, there's no need for Pakatan Harapan to trash out a deal with Warisan now or to trash out a deal with GPS now or to trash out a deal with anyone else now. Okay, because it's impossible. Everyone wants more seats. They are contesting against one another. They don't want to be part of our coalition. So we fight now. All right. Right. So there's no, no need to talk about common agenda and stuff like that now. Mm. But after elections, if they are a kingmaker, they cannot be kingmakers on their own. They that's still right. need to talk to a block. That's right. So they still need to negotiate. And that's when the Chinese say tao jia huan jia, that the negotiation <laughs> will take place with regards to policy goals, what we want to achieve. Uh, and there are certain things, certain red lines, for example, mm -hmm. that we will not compromise with. Mm. For example, we will not compromise with any uh, decisions to drop corruption cases mm. against those we know who are corrupt. Mm. So those, those are examples of red lines that we will not cross. Uh, right. We would rather sit in opposition than let Najib come out of prison. Right. You know, that, right. That, those are examples that I see. are there. But 
They are all on the table. They will be discussed after all right. the election. So since Tony, you mentioned about these red lines, right? Can you sh- perhaps share with us a little bit more? Uh, maybe a few of these red lines that's very solid, aside from just now you talked about the corruption one as well. Uh, what are a few that you think is like red line? It's definitely like, if can't agree, it's going to be hard to work together. Um, I think there are not that many hard red lines. There are some lines that are movable on the sand, in mm. the sand, uh, but hard red lines will be issues of corruption. Uh, preferred lines will be you know, improvements on our institutions, strengthening them to fight corruption, strengthening them for better democracy. Those will be lines that we hope can be accepted. Mm. And we are willing to move perhaps the, the, the exact location where we draw the line. Right. Uh, but those will be the rough things that we want to put uh, forward. And then we have to see what the other side's red lines right. are. It's going to be the year 2023 very soon. I know many of you will be thinking about New Year's resolution, setting new financial goals and stuff like that. But we all know it's not easy to plan or achieve those things. So from November to December, we'll be organizing a financial literacy month. There will be free weekly workshops and activities to help you figure out your financial goals, plans, and turn it into action for 2023. On top of that, when you attend our workshops, you will stand a chance to win some awesome Apple products as well. So sign up and reserve a spot for yourself via the link below. So at least I'm happy to see that uh, one of the major red lines is actually corruption, right? Because uh, we don't want that. That's right. Now, uh, having said that as well, I'm just going to go a little bit off tangent a little bit on this, right? Um, when we talked about uh, just now, right? Uh, post-election, people may end up working together. So while we see all this drama happening all around, right? Uh, post-election, it may not be anymore. Uh, but there is a lot of questions going on. Like, for example, uh, there's, they're saying that like, hey, certain parties is definitely a no-go. Like, uh, a lot of rumours going out there. I'm not even sure whether is it real, reported or fake, right? Like, uh, we'll never work with uh, PN because of the betrayal incident, right? Uh, we'll never work with Warisan because of such thing. But can, can we say that actually all these are not the main priority, but rather after that, then we'll see again? Or is it really like, mm, kind of solid? I will not be able to provide a definitive answer. It's okay. very easy for us to say, oh, they betrayed us before, therefore we'll never ever work with them again. But in the event, they have enough MPs, they come to us and sign a declaration that they agree with all our manifesto goals that will allow us to then become government and deliver on our goals. Mm. Uh, should we say no? Right. So like they say, yeah. so, so the the question is not so much no permanent friends and no permanent enemies. It's a question of whether uh, this time round, whatever that is agreed upon mm-hmm. can be locked down. Right. Okay. If, if, if we see it as an opportunity where the lockdown is secure, secure because they need us or secure because uh, we, we have mutual needs. Okay then perhaps it's worth a try going forward. But right. that, even that is a grey area. Mm-hmm. It's up to subjective judgments when the cut time comes, when the deal is being trashed right. out. I'll give a very simple example. We have two MOU experience. The first one was, uh, I proposed it myself, uh, the MOU to, with Muidin. Uh, okay. That time before, when Muidin was the prime minister, uh, when he offered some of the terms uh, that we would like, the, anti- uh, the, the, the anti-hopping law, the Undi 18, and mm. several other reforms that we have asked for, mm-hmm. uh, in exchange for tacit support to keep PN as a prime minister, okay? as opposed to collapsing, and then perhaps I'm no coming back to power. Mm. Okay? So uh, I supported, I offered, uh, and I supported the, the MOU with Muhyiddin. Uh, it was rejected ultimately by the Harapan leadership, okay? And Muhyiddin fell, mm. right? And the main reason why it was rejected because we don't trust Muhyiddin anymore. They betrayed us, Yep. right? Uh, my argument was, yes, they betrayed us, but if we can lock this deal in, okay, we will have a better outcome than letting within fall. Right. Okay. So that's 
one occasion where a deal was being negotiated but failed to materialize. Mm -hmm. Now, the second time round was when Ismail Sabri became the prime minister. Mm. Then he revived the deal and then Harapan talked about it, discussed it and decided this time round we will proceed with the deal with Ismail Sabri. Also anti-hopping law, Undi 18. And we got a lot of flag. We got a lot of flag. Many people say, how can you sign a deal with an AMNO prime minister? How can you trust them? Mm. They will bite you back. But because our leaders know that there are certain things that they need of us, Ismail Sabri needs us to maintain stability for his government because he's being attacked from within. Mm. The court cluster wanted them to, wanted him to, to, to do all sorts of things. He needs protection in terms of support from the opposition, Pakatan mm. Harapan, in order to run a stable government. Mm. Okay, so we agreed to provide tacit support for his government in exchange for carrying out some of these reforms. Right. You know, Anti-hopping law, you know, uh, the Undi 18, right. some of the parliamentary reforms, uh, parliamentary allocations for all MPs, etc. Mm. And because we understood the situation that they, he needs us, we believe that he will carry it out. So the deal was signed and it was indeed carried out. Mm. The anti-hopping law Right to the very end, there were critics out there who said they will never allow this anti-hopping law to be passed. So there were delays, but ultimately we were able to we were able to nudge the law into approval in uh, the parliament. So, right. so, so it's a question of discretion. It's a question of yes, they are our enemies, but if we can lock them down, and we trust that there's enough to hold them to the agreement. Okay, and they can deliver on the promises that we agreed upon, then a deal should be done. Mm. But just as what we did with Ismail Sabri, where the MOU was signed, and the most important anti-hopping law act was passed. Right. So just a question, right? Um, many people felt like there was a disappointment when, uh, when 2020 Sheraton move happened, right? And many people are also wondering, like moving ahead, if let's say PH can ever form a government again, right? What are some things that the PH can do to ensure this never happen again? And that's the anti-hopping law, which is why it was so important. Which was the reason why we were willing to provide tacit support for an AMNO Prime Minister. But that's almost unimaginable in the past, right? DAP, PKR, Amana giving tacit support for the I'm no prime minister right. to stay in power. Right. So I was reading a lot about uh, something that uh, Liu Chintong recently mentioned about right. setting up the traffic rules when it comes to uh, the whole policy, like uh, setting up like institutional reform, like uh, there, there needs to be a certain term for prime minister, there needs to be a set date for election and uh, even when it comes to uh, collecting uh, political donation and all this, he was saying that all this will will actually ensure a better system that eventually whoever who becomes the PM or the ruling government can't be too reckless. Yes. Like, so whoever, even if it's a stupid person, becomes also, yes. they, the Malaysian people will be protected. Can and you degree, share with us a little bit more about this? No, I, I ultimately is that the, the prime minister cannot act in a hegemonic way or the ruling party cannot ignore the institutions and the opposition. The one, 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 of, one of the key developments that took place over the past two years is that every time the budget was to be presented, the finance minister for the first time in Malaysian history consults the opposition and actually adopts some of the proposals that the opposition actually provided to uh, the government of the day. No, so, so, so this is, this has never been done before. Yep. In, in the past, in the first 10 years of me in parliament before 2018, it has always been one-sided. Okay? They will come up with a legislation. Okay? Uh, government wants to change something. This is the act. When the act gets stable, we read through it. Ah, yeah, they made a mistake. So we shout and scream in parliament. Okay, sometimes not shout and scream, but we raise it in parliament. Hey, any salah because of this wrong thing, okay, many people are going to be affected. Okay, so all you need to do is change one sentence and we accept. 
Mm. So we table an amendment to the bill. Just change that little sentence only. Mm. No big deal. They will either, one, refuse to change. They will say, pass first, we change later. Mm. Even though they concede that the argument is correct in parliament. Right. Eh, no, we pass first. Because I can pass it. Why do I need to bother with you? Right. I already have a solid majority. Majority. Okay. Reason is secondary. Okay. The 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 the, the absolute control is primary mm. for them. Okay. Or if I really face a lot of backlash, and some of the earlier bills did, okay, instead of just changing that one line which is very simple and doesn't waste time, okay, they tarik balik the whole bill. So we'll study again and we'll table it again next time. So that it will never be an opposition amendment to an existing bill. Right, right. So that they never have to be seen conceding right. to the opposition. Right. But what happened this time around? Uh, recently in a bill that was tabled, not in the latest sitting, but the sitting before, uh, what is known as the Generation Endgame bill, the tobacco bill, mm, mm. Uh, where anyone born after the year of 2007 will not be allowed to buy cigarettes mm. ever. You know, things like that. Uh, there were many instances where everyone was uncomfortable in the bill because there was uh, overwhelming amount of enforcement powers given to health authorities to search bags without warrants, to go into houses, oh, stuff wow. like that. It was, it was poorly drafted. Right. Right. Uh, and the other side obviously considered, yes, it was. Uh, there was debate and the bill was referred to a parliamentary select committee where the chairperson comes from the opposition. Of oh. course, the, the majority of the committee is from the government, but the chairperson was from the opposition, uh, YB Kelvin Yi, mm. uh, Kuching. Uh, and a lot of the proposals were then made to amend the bill and most of which have been accepted and adopted by uh, the government. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, the parliament was dissolved, so the, bill, the new bill was never tabled in right. time. So this is all part of the maturing democracy, where the institutions become stronger, where there's more respect across the floor. Mm. They cannot just trample all over the opposition. Mm. Yeah. These, are, these are nuances that I would say are not usually recognized, seen, or understood by the general man on the street. Yep. So based on, based on what I can hear, we can see that because of the fact that there's no like very, very dominant majority, the government automatically becomes more collaborative, yeah. right? Yes. So uh, to a certain extent, the way that you are saying it, right, makes me feel that actually it, it's kind of good to remain it this way. <laughs> Yeah, because you're forced to do that because when you're up to your discretion of the dominant party, uh, it's going to be harder sometimes. My last question about this, right, is actually this time round, there's a lot more new voters because of the Undi 18, right? And many people are wondering what's going to happen because never in history we had so many young voters. And we know that these young voters are very affected by social media. Many of these young voters are actually staying in the urban areas. Yeah, uh, yeah, so how do you think this time round, these young voters will affect this time's general election? All things equal, the immediate young voters, 18 to 20 years old, for example, are not going to vote very differently from their, the way their parents vote. Mm. So the stats that we have seen in Johor, for example, okay, uh, if the adults in that particular constituency, 70% votes for Harapan, the youth, the new voters, more or less 70% votes for Harapan. Right. If in that particular constituency, 60% uh, votes for BN, the kids, more or less 60% votes for BN. Mm. So there's, there's no immediate divergence between the way the new voters vote compared to the old voters in accordance to the constituency. Right. That's the snapshot scenario. The difference between new voters and older voters is that older voters are more entrenched. 
entrenched in their views and entrenched in their political affinity. Mm. The younger voters are perhaps not as entrenched. Yep. So they are susceptible to influences. As you said, they see a lot of stuff in social media, they get influenced by social media. But that's not a given that they can be influenced politically. They can, but it's not a given. Mm. Why? Because their social media is not politics. Right, right. Their social media is Blackpink, <laughs> BTS, or <laughs> the whoever who is latest in town, uh, Taylor Swift, uh, movies, uh, comics, uh, makeup. That's their social media. And social media today, the sad thing, the good and the sad thing is they only feed you the things you want to see. Mm. So you have a bubble. In your feed, if you typically see news on K-drama, you will see plenty of feeds on K-drama yep. and nothing else. That's right. Right? So, so you're not influenced by anything else. So actually, there is a great degree of ignorance among the younger voters. Right. Partly because of the way news is now fed to them. Mm. In the past, when you read newspapers, I remember as a teenager, I read newspapers, you are forced to flip. That's right. You will always read at least the headlines. Like even if you have not interested in the story, <laughs> you read the headline first. Oh, something happened here. Not interested, move on. Right? You will read a broad-based uh, stuff of stories. But today, no. I will only read things I'm interested in. Mm. And, and they'll keep feeding me this stuff. Right. So news today is very pillared, very siloed. Yes. I don't see a lot of things. And the other aspect that perhaps uh, are different for the new batch of voters, 18 to 21 years old, uh, is that they, they haven't quite come out to the real world yet. Mm. They've just finished school. Some of them perhaps just finished SPM or STPM. Yep. Uh, and you must remember that in SPM and STPM, they only tell you Malaysia is the best country in the world. <laughs> We have Bapak Demokrasi, Bapak Pemodenan, Bapak, Dem, uh, Bapak uh, uh, Kemerdekaan. We have the best prime ministers in the world. And they were all UMNO. Uh, and we have the, the, the number one for, for in, in the world for Kelapa Sawe. We are number two for BGT Ma. Whatever lah. We, yeah, we studied Malaysia right. is always the best. That's right. So the question someone was telling me, their kids was asking them, why do we have to work opposition? The government quite good, what? Mm. They have they have not gone to the real world. So they're not they have, exposed enough yet. They, they have not looked for a job yet. They haven't realized that. Oh shit! My starting pay is only thousand five, thousand eight. Mm. No, uh, cost of living. I have to pay for rental if I go to work in the cities. Uh, I want to buy a house. It's very difficult. It's expensive to get married. Uh, I want to have kids. Do I have enough income for kids? they have not got that stage of feel that pain yet that they feel the need to, I want to rebel. This useless government, Understood. I want to vote something else. So young voters, the pros, they're susceptible. They are open. They are more open than the older folks for different ideas. Uh, the cons, they have not yet been exposed to those mm. ideas. Okay. And trying to get them exposed at this stage, there are challenges. That's right despite the fact that they are always on social media. So we can say that actually the young voters is kind of like a quest, big question mark when nothing has been put, put, put on to a real test yet, right? Uh, as we can see, even the Johor ones, you know, it, the turnout rate wasn't that great as well. Some, right. some didn't even know that they are actually voters that's that right. are eligible to vote. So it's not put in the test yet. So finally, to wrap this up right now, um, what would you say to people who are going to be voting for the first time? For people who are just started to have this political aw aw awokenness, right? This awareness and say, okay, I, I want to, I'm going to vote. Like, so what are you going to say to them? I think the, the simplest thing, I mean, there are a lot of things you can tell a voter. Uh, I have the whole manifesto to <laughs> <laughs> show to we'll them. We'll leave that for the next session. <laughs> but ultimately, for Malaysia at this stage, it's a case of picking leaders who will not steal from the people. No, even if they are not very clever. <laughs> Let me just put it very bluntly, okay? Nobody is perfect in the political world. 
Yep. You have idiots on both sides of the fence. Uh, mm. My colleagues won't be very happy with me on this. Uh, <laughs> there are idiots on both sides of the fence. Okay, so most importantly, even if they are not the most competent, what is most important is they don't steal taxpayers' money. Because if you don't steal, no matter how bad you are, money goes back to the people. All right. Maybe less than efficient. Maybe some policies don't work as well, but at least they are back with the people. Whereas for a government that is occupied with those who steal, you will never see the end. You'll never see the light of your money. Right. It all goes into the coffers of the individual pockets. So at this stage for Malaysia, uh, we are not at a stage where we can ask for the sky, but we are at a stage where we can determine the direction of the country, whether mm. we continue as a kleptocracy. Uh, we managed to, in the interim, stop Najib in 2018. We don't want his successor to come back and do the same after Right. From the conversation with Tony just now, I fully agree that whoever is going to be the government, their utmost priority should be to establish a clean government. Only that way Malaysia can grow and Malaysians can prosper along. Nonetheless, I think the real kingmaker is you, the Rakyat, because you hold the power to vote. Like what they say in this video. The winning candidate won by 45 votes. 45? That's the size of a classroom in an underfunded government school in Malaysia. So go out and vote.